Okay, good morning, let's get started. Um, today's obviously the last lecture for this uh, course. Um, so um, the structure for today is we will really just go over some topics that you know are sort of general interest and I, that I think are important for you to know about. Um, one thing is most likely everyone in here will probably have an MRI in your lifetime or else we'll know someone has an MRI. So it's just helpful to know, you know, sort of cool to know if you're in the MRI scanner, what's being done to you. And, and so we'll go over some of the emerging uh, methods and, and some additional common scans that you'll probably have or know of someone who has these scans. Um, so, um, and then at the end of the lecture today, we'll leave some time to sort of address some, you know, end of course logistics. Um, I just did receive an update from the TAs, and so there, there might be some things happening um, very quickly. So we'll, we'll see how things uh, pan out, but we'll discuss it at the end of today's lecture. Um, so for before I start, are there any general questions or things that you would like addressed um, today? Yes. No pre-lecture quiz. I, I can make one up if you'd like one. No. <laughs> okay. Um, I figure seven is enough. <laughs> um, I, yeah, just a general word about the um, the homework, the MATLAB coded coding problems. Um, there were some announcements, and I just want to reiterate that the way those are graded is MATLAB runs a reference program and then compares it to your program. And so, in my program, um, I don't make use of for loops. I don't make use of F min S or solve or anything like that because those are iterative methods, okay? Those problems are meant to be solved with just very simple equations, you know, just like A equals B over C or something like, you know, area equals or width equals height, area over height, you know, things like that. So so just keep it simple, don't overcomplicate it and, and the, the, the solutions should be, uh, should provide a fairly, uh, good match. Um, and so that's just to keep that in mind. I know that, um, you know, although those um, those solutions are available in MATLAB, you know, if you go and look at actually like actual MRI pulse sequence code, we don't use those unless it's a very fancy thing. For anything um, standard, like the problems you're being asked to solve, it's just simple. If you look at the code, it's simply just this is the area, this is the width, let me figure out what the height is. That's all it is, okay? So we want you to also get to realize, always use the simplest solution possible when, when, when you have to, even though obviously you have all of MATLAB and Python available that, you know. Um, okay, so with that, uh, let me start. If there's no, more, no further questions, I don't see anything online. So today we're gonna sort of, uh, go fairly quickly, just to give you a sense of where the field is going. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about, recap a little bit of what we talked about parallel imaging. Uh, we'll talk about compressed sensing some more, and then finally sort of give you a sense of where things are with deep learning, um, which has really sort of become the state of the art. Uh, then we will talk about MRI diffusion flow simply because those are such important modalities that um, you will probably see a lot if you ever have an MRI exam or, or know of someone who does. And then we'll finally cap off by talking a little bit about you know, what might be in the future to keep an eye out for. And some of these topics will be discussed in more detail in some of the projects. So um, you know, we'll find out more about those in the projects as well. So just to remind you, last time what we said is you know, most of what we, and the way MRI taught was you know, for many years was basically we're just solving, you know, a very simple linear equation, you know, and we have the number of equations equals the number of unknowns. And so this is just represents the Fourier uh, basis functions. And so we're either doing a Fourier transform or an inverse Fourier transform. And that just can be represented as either multiplying by a matrix or multiplying by the inverse of the matrix. So this would be like the Fourier transform and this is the inverse Fourier transform, all right? Um, so the next thing is we said, well, what happens if we have more coils, many coils imaging at the same time? So that's what's known as parallel imaging. In that case, we have more equations uh, than unknowns. And so this is what's called an overdetermined problem. You might have heard that term before. And so in that case, we just have a least squares estimate. And this is what gave us the sum of squares solution. 
Okay, in that case, you basically just say, well, I'm gonna take every coil and just square it and then add up those squares and then take the square root. So it turns out that's a pretty good estimation. Um, and that is still done sometimes. You know, there, there you can actually see on scanners sums of squares. And, and for example, if you don't want to accelerate for whatever reason, you just want to, and you have multiple coils there and you're just running a standard sequence, the system still has to know how you want to combine the coils. And so that's what it will do. Okay. But by far the most interesting thing is underdetermined. Right, because this is what lets you go faster, right? Because you're taking less measurements than there are unknowns, and therefore you can go faster. And the in the limit, you would make this as short as possible, right? Make this make the number of equations as minimal as possible compared to the unknowns. And that way that's sort of your acceleration, how much faster you're going. And that's important because as we said before, for some clinical exams like pediatric imaging or cardiac imaging or any time where someone's moving, you want to actually go as fast as possible, okay? Um, also from the economic point of view, there's a lot of pressure in the healthcare system to do more with less. And so there is, you know, ideally radiologists like at UCSD, ideally the chair of our department would love to have all exams less than 15 minutes, okay? That's the dream, right? You just put the person in and they're out in 15 minutes. Um, and this, if we don't do anything special, we end up with the minimum norm estimate. And that's a little bit what you played around with in your MATLAB, where you sort of removed lines or columns in case space. And you know that gives you aliasing, right? So that's the problem. You know, if you just solve it without any other tricks, you get aliasing, okay? So the two things you can do are approaches is you can make the underdetermined become overdetermined. So you can go from here to here with parallel imaging. Okay, so that's one way, just make it so that you have enough data, right? The other way is put some constraints on this. Okay, put some prior assumptions on your M. So you're not just solving for any M, you're saying, I know the M, if I'm imaging a human, the, if, if I'm imaging a heart, I know what hearts look like. Even if it's a disease heart, it's not gonna be totally random. It's not gonna look like a rabbit or a cat, hopefully. Um, so there's a lot of information I should be able to use. All right, so those are the two main approaches we're gonna talk about either. Well, we, we'll sum up what we did with parallel imaging, but then mostly today, we're gonna talk about what happens when you constrain your estimate, okay? So this, this type of approach applies not only, this sort of constraining your estimate applies not only to MRI, but essentially almost any scientific problem, okay? Especially with deep learning, essentially, whether it's in, MR, in medical imaging, MRI, CT, PET, or whether it's trying to estimate um, any, anything you know, in, in science, we typically have measurements, right? And we're trying to estimate something about something. And so the more constraints you can put on your, um, your estimate, the more you can do with less data. Okay, so just to sum up, in parallel imaging, the main thing is we solve the problem by having multiple coils, okay? And we can do either sense recon, okay? Where we sort of have aliased images, but then we sort of, unfold the aliasing or undo the aliasing uh, by using matrix algebra and we end up with sort of a good um, image. Or we can do something more like grappa where we sort of fill in the missing points in case space. Then we create, we, uh, so then we have full Fourier and then we can sort of create, uh, un, uh, sort of reconstruct each of these and then do a coil combination with sum of squares and so these are sort of, um, although they're sort of seem like very different approaches, mathematically, there is a sort of connection between those, but we're not gonna go into that, okay? But the main thing is this, the way we solve the problem with parallel imaging is by just adding more coils, okay? Um, and then just to go back to this, there's no reason you can't do both of these, right? If you wanna go super fast, you can do both parallel imaging and constrain your estimate. And that's typically what's done, right? You have those coils anyway, so you might as well use them, 
and at the same time constrain your estimate. Okay. And this is what we talked about before, which is essentially everything we've talked about so far is saying, I want to solve this big space, right? I, I need to set up my equations. And so all this means I have to satisfy Nyquist, right? And I have to be, you know, either uh, I have to be overdetermined. or critically sampled. So at least the number of equations has to be greater than equal to the number of unknowns. Okay. If I, if I really have to solve for any possible image, right? But it turns out if I'm willing to say, you know, actually the images I want to look at are actually in a much smaller space, okay? And so if you think about, if you remember a little bit about some of you, you know, back to linear algebra, you can talk about there's a big vector space, right? And within that space, there's like a subspace, part of that space, right? So this could be a subspace or in deep learning, we'll talk about what's called a manifold. So sort of just sort of some sort of structure that's low dimensional. And so your hope is that this is low dimensional. Or at least the dimensions of this space are way less than dimensions of the overall space. So you're basically, these are huge dimensional space of solutions. You're looking for a small, you're saying my space lies within some smaller dimensional subspace or manifold of the overall space. Okay. So the first really attempt at this was compressed sensing, which came out of um, really the mathematics and, and statistics community, and then was applied later to medical imaging. And this has been not only in medical imaging, but applied to, for example, you know, video cameras and, and new designs for, for, for all sorts of imaging. Uh, just to remind you, here's the overall picture that if this is the full Fourier space, we essentially say, I can just get rid of a lot of that data. And in compressed sensing, what we tend to do is we tend to randomly sample K space, okay? And the random sampling means that the, if I, if I, samp if I subsample or, or sample like every other line, then I'm going to have a very structured aliasing. I'm going to have repetitions, right? But if you think about randomly sampling things, then I'm just going to get random aliasing. And so the, the aliasing is going to appear sort of like noise-like. And that is good because it sort of will spread the energy out over um, dimensions that I can then just get rid of. So that's shown here, where if I just do a, a standard minimum norm reconstruction, like what you might do in MATLAB, like if you just do the inverse FFT, this is what you'd get. And notice here, it doesn't look like the aliasing you saw, we saw before, right? There's no real structure to that aliasing. It just looks like noise, right? So the idea, and that's the key principle that this noise, if we go in into the right signal domain, we should be able to get rid of that noise, okay? And then we do that in the right way, we can get back to this picture, all right? And that's, when this came out, this fairly remarkable, result. It's actually got some very strong theoretical underpinnings to it. Um, so any of you who are more interested in the math and statistics, this is really uh, sort of very interesting literature to look at, but there, there's actually some very strong theoretical results that show that why this is the case. Okay. Uh, so here's the basic picture. Remember, we're measuring some signal E that where this is my object. This is the encoding matrix. And this is the signal I'm measuring, right? And what we wanna do is we wanna estimate this object with some M hat, right? So this first term here is just saying, I don't really know what my object is, but I can come up with an estimate of it. And that estimate, I can say the signal from that estimate is E times M hat, right? My actually measured signal was S. So what I wanna do is I wanna make S minus EM hat. That's essentially the error of my estimate, right? Okay. And data consistency is saying, I just wanna keep this error pretty small, okay, which makes sense, right? I've measured the data. I have measured data. So if my data, if, my, if the signal that I predict varies too much from my actual measurement, then you know, I, I should take that into account. I don't want to just totally ignore what I've measured. Otherwise, I don't need to do the measurement, right? So that's the one constraint. Now, the other one is we're going to minimize this thing, which is psi m hat, 
and this is a sparsifying transform. This is this is where we're putting on. This is sort of where we put in our assumptions. Okay, we're just going to look at one example of that. Um, so it turns out that phi can be any transform, but typically it's going to be something like a wavelet transform, or something that transforms me into some domain where um, noise has a different property. So, um, and those of you who know about wavelet transforms are associated with things like discrete cosine transforms. This is all sort of the underlying machinery of the internet, right? That's why you can sort of do you um, like you can uh, stream the World Cup, right? To everywhere, right? Uh, because we can basically take our signal and apply a transform where most of the information is carried in a few coefficients. Okay. So that's what this sparsifying transform is. So if I take this image here and do this wavelet transform, you notice that in the wavelet transform, only a few coefficients are big and a lot of them are relatively small. Okay, so the noise sort of gets spread out over all this and really the information is carried here. So basically this is saying, we wanna minimize this. This at one stands for the L1 norm. So it's like minimizing this, I can do that by really getting rid of a lot of this noise part. Okay, so I'm looking for the most sparse transform, sparse representation possible. And if I do that, then that tends to get rid of all these incoherent artifacts and I'm left with that image, okay? So by imposing this constraint on what my image should look like, then I can sort of get a much better looking image. Um, and certain images are naturally sparse. For example, if you do an angiogram, you know, most of the image is sort of dark and you only have image in certain places. So even here you could do, um, you could find transforms that sort of emphasize, just give me the image that will look the most uh, will have the fewest vessels, okay? And so for example here, this is what you get with Nyquist sampling. This is what you get with low resolution. So you could just remember, you could just not acquire the higher K space values and you'd get this solution. You could also just do a linear reconstruction, okay? And you'd get something like this. But if you do compressed sensing, you get something much better than the actual, much closer to the actual full Nyquist sampling. All right. Um, and this is just some clinical data showing, for example, um, this is the full data and you do fairly well. This is like a threefold acceleration. You go three times as fast or you can go six times as fast and the compressed sensing does pretty well. Okay. So this is huge because it means that you can go, for example, from a 12 minute exam to like a two minute exam. All right. Okay, so that's really sort of very quick uh, highlights of compressed sensing. Um, any questions about that before we move on? Yes. Yeah, so that's the, um, the sampling actually turns out to be sort of a random sampling of K-space. So it's not really, cart it's sort of, I mean, you're still moving through K-space. So th those equations, you know, K, X equals, the integral of gx t dt that's still how you move through k space but it's sort of like instead of moving linearly through k space you find you're trying to find the most effective way of randomly sampling k space yeah another question is mhat representing the partially randomly sampled Fourier transform or is it like oh yes mhat is just your best estimate of your image oh, okay. so it actually gets iterated you basically this typically is an iterative iterative computation. So that's one thing we'll talk about later. This tends to take a lot of time. So it's like some kind of gradient. Yeah, exactly. You're saying you might start off with an M hat that's alias and then you over time, okay. you sort of converge on the thing that sat, minimizes this subject to this constraint. So it is an iterative search. Yes. It's becoming more used, yeah. Yeah, I would say since 2007, so that's what, 15 years ago? I'd say in the last five or seven years, it's become, a, I mean, that's pretty fast. I mean, generally it takes something at least 10 years to go from first discovery to the clinic. Deep learning is actually much faster. It's actually less than almost like five years. So it's, it's moved incredibly fast. Um, but yeah, I think there for certain applications, um, 
is still used. Um, but I think now between compressing and deep learning, there's gonna be some interesting uh, sort of competition as to which does better. It's not completely used everywhere. Like for example, in a lot of our research scans, I mean, no one tends to use this, but for certain applications, it is becoming more used. Okay, so that gets us to deep learning. Um, and the first, you know, one of the first papers on this was in Nature 2018, so a very high profile paper. And the idea here is, um, it's talking about, you can have different sensors, right? And then for every uh, modality, you know, you have to learn all the details. <laughs> like if you learn MRI physics, or you have to learn CT, and then you have to come up with an image. And so, you know, maybe after many years of learning, you figure out how to do this, right? And so the idea with deep learning is, well, forget about all this, right? Let's just let the computer figure it out. Okay. And so essentially the thing is you just take your data, you put it through some, these are some fully connected layers and then um, some convolutional layers and you deconvolve it and then you end up with your image and it's almost like magic. Okay. Um, and actually it's, this is like the actual code that implements it. So it's actually, you know, with TensorFlow, um, you know, we've had high school students sort of do this, okay, because it's just, Google has made it so easy to implement things like this, okay? Um, so just to give you a sense of what some of the results are, this is from that Nature 2018 paper. So this is, uh, remember MRI, we can go any way through K-Space. So you could even do a radon projection like CT. You could do spiral or undersampled Fourier or even misalign. Assume you just sort of collected the data, sort of, you know, you didn't collect the lines in sync, right? And so this is the image that you would get, the, the, the ideal image. And here, if you look at conventional imaging, you can sort of see, hey, you know, like this FF, the, the slice the radon transform of this is okay, but it's looks a little bright here. Uh, this is looks okay. This one obviously um, probably doesn't have as much resolution. And this one has a lot of aliasing artifacts, okay? And then this is the auto map, which gives you sort of very nice looking images. And so in this case, it's really saying that all these images have some underlying truth, but they also have a lot of artifacts which don't really lie, which really don't belong to the images, okay? And so the way they train these is with, um, they'd actually even use, at least in the first iteration, they didn't actually even use MRI images to train this network. They basically just train on a bunch of things from like ImageNet. You know, because anything from the natural world tends to have certain features to it. So, uh, for example, all of us are very, you know, just very quickly, you can determine if something looks right or not, right? It's some, because you have this database of, you know, people look like this, animals look like this, buildings look like this, cars look like that. So if there's anything that doesn't match that prior experience, you know right away, right? Or even with human beings, right? We're really good at recognizing faces, right? So if, even if someone's, the distance between someone's eyes is slightly off and doesn't match your database, you will, your, your, your neural mechanisms will, it, it will immediately cause a fear response because you're like, ah, that's not really, there's something wrong with that human being, okay? Now, this was actually a problem in the early days of computer animation. Um, so um, it's something called, you, some of you might've heard something called the uncanny valley. Has anyone heard of that term, the uncanny valley? Okay, so there's some, this, some people know about that. So there's this, this classic Pixar film from the, one of the early Pixar films where there's like a baby. Have you, has anyone seen this? Like a, almost a black and white. And this, if you go back and look at this, I, I should probably, I'll send a link out if I, if I can find it. This baby looks really creepy. It's like the most creepy baby. And it's in the early days of, of um, Pixar where they're trying to make the baby look human. But it turns out we are, our brains are so well tuned to what a human should look like that if you're just a little bit off from what a human should look like, then you get really freaked out. It's like, oh, there's something wrong with that human, okay? So that's why if you look at Pixar films now, they look more cartoonish, right? They either look more realistic or more cartoonish, but there's this uncanny valley where if you're not, if you're just a little bit off from what a human looks like, then um, humans don't like that. If you're far enough off from what a human looks like, then humans are like, well, that's just a cartoon, so I'm okay with that. And if you're super realistic, then that's okay too. So that was the uncanny valley that 
animators had to deal with. Um, so I forget why I was talking about that. What was I talking about there? <laughs> okay. All right. So um, anyways, the pretty cool thing is, um, whoops. Um, if you look at these convolutional kernels, what it's coming up with is you see the kernels have these patterns. What do these patterns remind you of? See these stripey patterns? Those sort of look like Fourier functions, right? Like we talked a lot about stripes in different directions. So this basically rediscovers a lot of, you know, saying, hey, you know, if I want to represent my data, it turns out that some stripey patterns is a pretty good representation of my data. Okay. And, but it just finds that by looking at millions and millions of images. Okay. Um, and so, for example, this is the fully sampled image. This is where I want to go. Four by four means I've accelerated four in two dimensions. So I'm going 16 times as fast. You can see it does pretty well. And this is comparing it to the best sense algorithm. And you can sort of see the error here in AutoMap is lower than the error in the sense. Um, and this algorithm took, you know, many people, many man years to figure out how to do this, right? This auto map probably did it, you know, lots of computer time, but did it fairly quickly, okay? Um, it works really well also in the low signal um, regimes. And so for example, um, here, if I have reference the auto map, the conventional data sort of um, doesn't do so well. Um, but the auto map is able to sort of know that, okay, noise doesn't really belong to my image domain. So I'm, I can get rid of the noise. Okay. And so here in the highest in our case, both auto map and conventional do well. So this is SNR of 23 and 8.5. And then as we go to lower SNRs, uh, that's where things fall off. I don't remember why they have different SNRs here though. Okay, so let me just give you an overview of what people are working on. So there's different ways that you can, you can sort of do um, deep learning. One is you can take the inverse FFT of your data. And so you might end up with something like with a lot of artifacts or noise. And then you ask the deep learning network to get rid of those artifacts and noise. Okay, so that's one approach you could take. Uh, the other approach you could do is domain transfer learning where you basically just take the data like auto map, take the Fourier data or the case-based data and just run it through the deep neural network and ask the neural network to do everything for you. Okay. You could also do a hybrid approach where you do an inverse FFT, come up with some you know, aliased image, run it through a deep neural network, but also um, uh, you can also, um, let's see, add some of the original sort of estimate here. And so you're sort of using both sort of weighting conventional and deep learning together to get um, your image. Um, and you can also do sensor domain where you basically stay in case space, have the deep neural network sort of clean up case space for you, and then do the inverse FFT. So these are all approaches that people are working on. Um, and so one of the things about um, deep learning that's really um, sort of striking is that, you know, as compared to conventional imaging time, both compressed sensing and machine learning can really reduce your imaging time, right? But if you look at also, you know, there's imaging time and there's reconstruction time. And so conventional imaging typically nowadays is pretty fast recon, okay? Compressed sensing, it's getting better, especially with more advanced GPUs and processors, but because an iterative approach can take a while. And that can be a problem in the clinic because if you want the image to come very quickly so you can decide on some clinical decision, then you don't have to wait for like waiting an hour for an image is really not acceptable um, for certain circumstances. Uh, the cool thing about deep learning is it may take a while to train the coefficients, but once you have the coefficients, it's just a forward problem. And so the computation is very fast. And so that's a lot of the excitement about um, deep learning is because it's something that's very fast. And so the manufacturers are just are making their systems more and more open these days such that anyone who has a deep learning algorithm can just put it into the system and have it computed, okay? Um, so let's talk a little bit about how this relates to sort of what we talked about before, um, just to give you a sense of um, 
we talked before about if you have an object, you can imagine just running it, multiplying it by some matrix and getting your case based data, right? And we say if it's undersampled, the problem is there's infinite, it's, it's an underdetermined equation. So there's infinitely number, an infinite number of solutions that could solve this equation, right? And so the question for deep learning is how do you pick out of all these infinite possible solutions, how do you pick the right one? Okay, so that's really the question is, we know there's all these solutions. And in fact, the traditional thing is pick the minimum norm solution. But the problem with that solution is it gives you aliasing. So the task of deep learning is out of all these possible solutions, find a better solution for me. Okay. Find the best solution based on my training of what good images should look like. So for example, this is a possible solution to this problem, but this is a better solution to the problem, right? These are both solutions to my problem. Deep learning wants to move me from here to here. So that's the question. Is the net, can I make the network such that in this case, if I'm in the image domain, can it move me from here to here? Okay. So the idea is basically, we wanna look for these low dimensional manifolds Okay, so sort of an extension of a subspace. And so basically we're just trying to, the, the network is just trying to find this space of solutions and saying, whatever I find, I wanna constrain my solution to be on that space of possible images. Okay, and I'm just gonna find the closest possible solution. All right. Uh, so that's sort of a very high level overview of what deep learning is doing. So let me just talk a little bit about how it's being, uh, available. So now, um, you know, it didn't actually take very long for um, the manufacturers to start offering deep learning. And so this is an early view of deep learning um, from, I think, GE, where basically showing that um, uh, basically um, these images here, uh, you sort of see this ringing here, this ringing artifact, this Gibbs ringing artifact for the conventional imaging it's really reduced here with the deep learning. Okay. Um, same thing here, essentially, as you see here with conventional learning, as we decrease, increase the voxel size, you're sort of seeing more Gibbs ringing and more sort of blurriness. And with deep learning, actually, even as you increase the voxel size, your resolution, visually, it doesn't seem like you're losing much, okay? Because it's able to sort of capture what it thinks an image should look like. Um, here's a case where they use deep learning to go, um, this took like two minutes, like 127 seconds. This took 15 seconds. So I'm basically a factor of 10 speed up, okay? And you can sort of see the image quality. In fact, this faster image, you could argue looks better than this longer image, okay? Um, and this is in case where they um, they kept the, the scan time the same, both two and a half minutes, but are arguing that you get much better detail in this image versus that image. Uh, here they reduced, they kept the scan time the same as well, and, and also just showing much sharper delineation here versus here. Um, and here they went faster and sort of arguing that they're keeping the quality so this is the low resolution. This is the three minute scan. This is the two minute scan. It's not such a huge improvement, but still they're, they're arguably getting slightly better image quality with less time. Okay, okay so I think um, that's just to sort of go very quickly through where the field is going. And so, you know, most likely if you get a scan today, you know, most of the scan will probably be done with conventional imaging, some parallel imaging maybe compressed sensing and maybe deep learning. Uh, but if you come back five years from now, it's, it's most likely gonna be a lot more deep learning. Okay. So great. So before we switch gears, any questions on this area? Yes. This one? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think 
you'll see stuff. I mean, there, there's one, one issue is sometimes there's, um, there's what's published and there's what the manufacturers do, right? And so you're not always sure what the manufacturers do. Like for example, I think GE is just doing this, but I'm really not sure. Um, you can sometimes gather by how they, um, I, I think, I, I remember, I think that, I think they are doing something like this because they sometimes will publish a little bit of what they're doing, but that's typically a very high level overview of what they're doing. And then um, uh, the thing about everything in medical imaging, like for example, the problem sets you have are giving you just a very high level overview of, you know, how the computations are made. Typically to make these things work in practice, there's a lot of like tweaking and sort of, you know, what happens if this happens. And so um, these are even these pictures, um, you know, I, for example, even in, in just standard deep learning, like when you look at networks, there's a lot of tweaking that goes on, right? And then like, for example, you have like feed forward connections and you know, how many of those do you have? And how many layers do you have? And so those details aren't always given. Um, so um, what is the best? Um, yeah, I don't know if the, if the field has decided what's the best yet. Um, I think um, it's still an active area of research. Uh, maybe one of you will figure out what's the best. Okay. okay. All right. Question. Oh, what do we research? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think there's a lot of topics being researched here at UCSD. I don't, deep learning isn't typically, I mean, there is actually some deep learning being done in cardiac imaging, but not so much for recon, but much more, more for like getting more out of the data. Um, so in terms of pure image recon, I don't think there's any groups doing just pure image recon. Um, there might be some groups in double E, I mean, Dr. Rao did a lot of stuff in compressed sensing. Um, but I, I don't, we're not, that's not one of the areas that we're actively researching. We, we tend to, there's other areas that we, we look at. Okay. Uh, the thing with MR is it's, it's just like there's literally like 50 different subfields that you could go into <laughs> and 50 is sort of a very like that's just a very rough division and then in each of those subfields there's like subfields and so um i think that's one of those things that you know certainly i didn't have a sense of you know in undergrad or even early grad school it's just you know when someone says you know your mri or even if you're in electrical engineering or whatever engineering, i mean that almost tells you nothing about what they do right like what is a bioengineer right or what's electrical engineer i mean you know i've had electrical engineering professors who could not solder a circuit to save their life right whereas you know as a you know the common picture of a double e is they should be able to build circuits right but you know a, a lot of my professors have just been pure mathematicians right who so, so the same thing with MR, you can have people who do all, all they do is physics or all they do is math or all they do is image processing. And so there's just a lot of fields, yeah. So the best thing is just find something you're interested in and, and sort of see what's the closest to that. Yeah. Okay, so um, I do wanna spend some time giving you a sense of, um, so far we've really just mostly talked about how do you image things that are static you know, coming up with nice images and what are the criteria, but a really big part of MR that's pretty unique to MR um, is you can actually, you're very sensitive to things that are moving, not just at the macro level, but also at the micro level, okay? And that, that allows you to do some really interesting things, uh, especially with biological specimens that are alive because anything that's alive has got a lot of stuff going on. So the first thing we're going to talk about is diffusion. And, and once again, just to give you a sense of this, and, and the reason is because this is such a widely used modality, it, it, it's really good to know about it. Um, so just to remind you what diffusion is, diffusion is just the random motion of particles. Okay. So for example, if I have a particle here and, and I just let it go, then um, it, it's just going to take some random walk through space. Okay. The other thing you can imagine is if I had a bunch of particles at the origin, I let them go, then they're just going to randomly diffuse out. Okay. And so the diffusion 
width is basically well described by a Gaussian. So the more time I wait, the more they spread out. So if I had a bottle of like perfume in this room and I opened it, then over time, the radius of that perfume would increase as a square root of time, okay? So by at some point, all of you would smell it, but it would take some time. Um, and so that, that width depends a little bit on the dimension. So this is 1D, 2D, and 3D. So in this case, in this room, depending on the diffusion coefficient of perfume in the air, it'd be the square root of six times that diffusion coefficient times time. Okay, that's how long it would take for you to start sort of getting a sense of the smell. Okay. So now let's talk about why MR is really ideally suited to measuring diffusion. Okay. Um, so we're gonna consider the case where once again, we need to think about the phase of the spins. And we're gonna think about the phase of these two spins in the presence of this gradient field, okay? And one of these spins, well, both of these spins are gonna diffuse, okay? So this spin here, the blue spin here moves into a weaker part of the field, right? So it's not gonna process as fast. So it's gonna go counterclockwise. It's gonna lose some phase. This guy here has gone to a um, even, this is a negative gradient, so it's gone even weaker field, it's more negative. So it's even gone even further lag behind, okay? So even just two spins moving randomly are gonna acquire a different phase if I have this in the presence of the gradient for a certain amount of time. Now the trick is I come back and I turn on the gradient and I reverse it, okay? And so um, in this case, that's going to make the spin wanna come back this way and this spin is gonna come back this way. But they basically, um, because they're still moving, they don't actually, like if this just stayed still and I reverse the spin, the thing, then it would just come back to the origin. But since it's moved into a stronger part of the field here, it's gonna overshoot and still have some net phase. And this guy here, he keeps moving out this way. And so he, he moves into a stronger part of the field. And so he overshoots even more. And so there's this net dephasing of the spins moving randomly in the presence of, of fields. Okay. Whereas if I had a spin that wasn't moving, let's say I had a spin here, okay, then it would acquire some net phase, okay. But then here, since it didn't move, it would just it would just be refocused and come back at the origin. Okay, so it would have no net phase at the end of the experiment. Okay, so that's the key: that only spins that are moving around are going to have some net phase. Um, that's shown here, where basically, um, without diffusion, if nothing moved, we apply net phase, but then we can completely reverse that phase since since some of just spin echo. With diffusion, these guys, the, these two ones, stay the same. So at the end of the experiment, they're they're back at phase of zero, but this guy here moves it around to another part of the field, and so he acquires some net phase. Okay. Uh, and this is a different picture of that as well. Um, and so it turns out that you, you can imagine the more things can diffuse, the more they're gonna just randomly experience different fields. And so when, they, when you're at the end of the experiment, you're gonna have much more dephasing. And so what happens is the signal you measure is proportional to the diffusivity, D, and B, which is called the B factor. Okay, and the B factor just depends on your pulse sequence parameters. So that's something you dial in and can determine, all right? So we're not gonna go into the derivation of that formula, but just to let you know that that's what we have. So what it means is that, um, you know, for example, if I look at different um, uh, images, remember I have E to the minus BD, right? So as diffusivity goes up, my signal should go down, right? Because it's going as e to the minus bd. And as diffusivity goes down, then my signal will go up, okay? And so this is where it's really useful. So here, look at this image here. This is a T2 weighted image. If this was the only image you have, this brain looks pretty normal, 
right? Like this actually person actually had a stroke. But if you just look at this image, it's like, nah, it looks okay, right? If you look at a diffusion weighted image, all of a sudden, wow, you don't have to be a rheologist to say something's going on with this person. Okay. And so for, for people who have strokes, this turns out to be one of the more common uh, images that uh, sort of types of images that, oops, how come I can't get rid of that? What's going on here? Okay, there we go. So what's going on in this area of the brain? Is the diffusion higher or lower in this part of the brain? Is D higher or lower where this signal is bright? Yeah, it's lower, right? So we must have diffusion has decreased in that part of the brain. Okay, so it turns out that, especially with people who've had strokes, those areas of the brain where it, the, the tissue was really affected by the stroke tend to have lower diffusivity, right? So that becomes a very important uh, thing. Here's another example where, you know, the T2 weighted image does look slightly different, right? So you might say, well, something's going on, but it's really not clear. Is this just normal variation? Maybe they were born like this, who knows, right? But if you look at the diffusion weight image, well, that's pretty striking, right? And this tends to say that all this area of the brain was affected by this um, stroke. And so if you look at the angiogram, in fact, this vessel here is the one that was impeded, okay? And so all the areas fed by this vessel basically died uh, during the stroke. So it turns out that um, after a stroke, normal water movement is restricted. And so diffusivity decreases, so the signal intensity de increases. Right? So that's one very uh, wide application of diffusion. Now, the other one is actually really interesting and it applies not only to disease, but actually to just looking at healthy subjects, which is the idea that if I just have water, like in a room like this or air or perfume, it will tend to, there's really, uh, at least for a while, there's the, the particles can diffuse anywhere, right? Equally probable, right? But um, if I put myself into a little closet, like there's a closet back there <laughs> where all this audio equipment is, I open up my perfume in there, it's gonna hit the, ball, the walls pretty fast, right? And so there's not gonna be free diffusion, right? Or if I had a tube, right? then things are diffused more easily along the tube than against the tube, right? So, um, so that's what's called anisotropic diffusion where there's a preferred direction for diffusion, okay? So if I have, for example, particles, water particles that are aligned with some fibers in my body, either like in the heart or in the brain, then water is gonna tend to diffuse more along one direction than the other directions. So that's called anisotropic diffusion. Um, and it turns out that MR is actually explicitly sensitive to that because we can set up the gradients to be sensitive to direction of diffusion. Okay. So for example, if the gradient is in the horizontal direction, I'm only gonna be sensitive to diffusion moving in this direction. If I put the vertical gradient on, I'm mostly sensitive to diffusion moving in this direction. Okay. And so you can sort of see here, it's sort of interesting. If you look at um, this area of the brain, where there's a lot of fibers. If I put the diffusion on in this direction, the fibers are running left to right here. Okay. So you notice that here, there's a big gap, right? That means there's a lot of diffusivity, diffusion going left to right, right? Because remember we're having e to the minus BD. So D, if D is big, then my signal goes down, okay? Whereas here, the gradient is going this way. And notice how bright that signal is. That means I don't have much diffusion going this way, okay? And similarly here, this means that the gradient's going into the paper, into the slide, okay? And notice how bright the signal is everywhere here. That means these fibers are not running in and out of the slide. They're running in the other directions, all right? Uh, so it turns out that with diffusion imaging, then you just do a lot of directions, okay? And then you can sort of start looking at the diffusion in different directions and sort of coming up with sort of 
what's what's the diffusion look like um, and which direction is the primary diffusion going okay so we're not going to go through this but just to show you that um, at the end of the day you can sort of say that here's my t2 weighted image this is the fractional anisotropy this is how anisotropic things are like whether there's a preferred direction and you can see see here in the brain this fa is really high in what's called the white matter so that's all the wiring in your brain okay and here this color map just tells you a sense of which way it's going so this is sort of these fibers are going this way these fibers are going this way uh, and so on and so forth so you could do just a color map but you could go even further and you can say well i know or i have an estimate in every voxel of which way water is flowing so what if i just connect the dots Right? What if I just look at the flow lines? And so I can start doing what's called tractography and using this data to sort of say, estimate how the fibers are actually going through my brain just by sort of following along here. So for example, here, I'm saying it's going this way and here it's going this way. Okay. And so that's what diffusion tensor imaging does. Essentially, we just use the, the gradients in different directions and we come up with these sort of amazing fiber maps of the brain. Okay. And it's advanced so much that, um, and these are some maps from the Human Connectome Project. Um, and these are still pretty amazing. I mean, this means that um, I can put any of you in the scanner. And after just, in this case, this is an eight and a half minute scan. No contrast, essentially just put you in the scanner, scan you, and then I can actually map the wiring in your brain. Yes. Uh, it's largely automated. Yeah, I mean, there, there's just so much data you couldn't, I mean, you can't, yeah, I mean, there there are, the only time where you have to intervene is sometimes there's errors, but I mean, obviously this is the best data they have so they're showing this data, um, but it's largely automated. It's all, it's all actually turned out to be linear algebra again. Um, and, um, uh, there are still issues, like for example, when things are crossing or when they bend. You know, sometimes there's errors, but um, it's still striking. And, and in fact, this is really the only way you can do it in a living human being, right? I mean, you can't even in a dead human being, like the way they used to track fibers, even in, in like dead animals, is you inject, like you might inject a contrast agent into one fiber and then watch how it goes and track it. But you have millions of fibers so there's you know it's like even that is really hard to do so this is sort of one case where mri actually can do something that is almost impossible with any other modality okay? because basically we're able to track water moving around simultaneously everywhere okay. so this is one thing that um, for example if you're having surgery right let's say you're having to have a tumor removed this clinician might want to see how the fibers are going so that they can make sure that, you know, they have a sense before they go in of, okay, you know, how do I avoid sort of injuring these fibers? Okay. Um, from a research point of view, it's sort of interesting in terms of development. This is looking at the fiber tracks um, going from two weeks to one year to two years. And you can sort of see here at two weeks, there's really not much connection. The brain is really not that well connected and really, a lot of what development is, uh, so this is going from two weeks to one year, in this case, to an adult, okay? And so it turns out that really, at least the latest data seems to indicate that it's around um, about 25 years where all of this is fully complete, okay? And interestingly enough, you know, I'm not sure it's still the case, but it used to be that, for example, insurance companies won't rent you a car, let you rent a car until you're 25, you know, and, and things like that. And so statistically, they already figured out that 25 was important for people to sort of make the right decisions. From a brain point of view, it turned out that sort of, it's not that your brain doesn't keep maturing after 25, but that's, that's a very sort of point where on average, the brain is finished doing most of its major wiring and development, okay? After that, you can still develop your brain, but it's just much harder. <laughs> Lots of training required. Okay, any questions on diffusion before we move on? Okay, so the next thing I wanna give you a sense of is, is flow, 
okay? And the reason why is it's also based on the same principle of gradients. But in this case, instead of dealing with random motion, we're dealing with deterministic motion, like right? something flowing in a certain direction, okay? So in this case, this, this voxel stays the same and this voxel moves in some direction with a certain flow. And so here, this guy who stays the same experiences some counterclockwise rotation. This one is moving into a weaker part of the field. And so it's gonna move even more, okay? And then we reverse it and do the, repeat the experiment. This guy here basically recovers its phase completely. So it comes back to zero phase. Okay, because we just reverse the gradient. Whatever it lagged, we make up for with a certain amount of time. But this one here, because it's moving into a stronger part of the field, it overcompensates. And so instead of just coming to here, it actually goes all the way to here. And so it overcompensates and acquires the net phase theta, okay, which turns out to be proportional to velocity. Okay, so it turns out the phase of moving spins actually depends on their velocity. And so that's pretty cool because basically it means now we can start imaging flow fields um, in biological tissues. And I'm not gonna go through this, but just, just give you the highlights of so the phase. As you know, we can always write as the integral of the frequency and here's the gradient terms. And previously we assumed that X, Y, and Z were just static things. But now let's consider X moving with some velocity and some some acceleration, then it turned out the phi, the phase determines, depends on a quantity that's M naught, which we've looked at before, this is the area under the gradient. But now we have this other term, velocity times this term here. And this is what's known as the first order moment of the gradient. So we have G times tau here, okay? And so it turns out the phase can be written as something that's related to my position, which is how we do imaging but it's also related to my velocity. And we can even make it sensitive to my acceleration. And the way we do that is through the gradients. So if I have an area under my gradient, remember that's what moves me in k-space. If I have a first order moment, this is what moves me in velocity space or k-space. And this will what would allow me to look at different accelerations. So we're just gonna really focus on this first order moment. So it turns out that the most common gradient is what's called a bipolar gradient. And notice it has a property that the first, the zeroth order moment is zero, right? This has zero area, right? So this doesn't move us around in image case space at all, right? But this is the first order moment and it actually does have a first order moment, which is given by this expression. So we use gradients like this to sensitize our experiment to velocity. Um, and so what we can end up with is uh, something like this where uh, this is showing in a slice through someone's uh, neck, the velocity estimates and the black here is carotid. So this must, this, you know, showing some velocity, uh, the arteries. So the arteries are moving this velocity, right? So they've got, in this case, they're giving a negative sign. So um, indicating some velocity. And here, the white things are the juggler veins. So they're bringing blood away. And so they have a different color because they have a velocity that's in, in the opposite sign. And we can even do this over the heart cycle. So you can sort of see here, this is measuring different arteries uh, and looking at as a function of time through the cardiac cycle, how the velocity changes in these vessels. And so these are in the, uh, I believe, uh, these are in your carotids and this is in your vertebral arteries. And you can sort of see the blood is moving fairly fast, you know, on the order of 40 centimeters per second up through. Okay. Uh, this is just an example showing blood flowing. If I can sense it just the same way with diffusion imaging, I can make myself sensitive to which way blood is flowing. So I apply the gradient in this direction. I'm sort of sensitive to blood flowing in this direction. And if I apply the gradient in this direction, I'm sensitive to blood flowing in this direction. So here, you know, I've got blood flowing this way and blood flowing this way, okay, which makes sense. So off the blood comes up into your circovolus and then goes off in different directions, okay? Uh, 
Um, and then one cool thing you can do is uh, you can apply X, Y, Z gradients, right? And so you can sort of say, what's the component of blood flowing in all in X, Y, and Z? And so then you can actually have a velocity field and characterize that. And you can do that over time. And in this case, you can do it over a heartbeat. And so this is um, an example of this. It's called 4D flow. I think there'll be a project on this. And so you can actually start visualizing how, um, how blood flows through the heart, okay? Um, and it turns out a sort of acute uh, um, sort of fact is that uh, a student who took this course the first time we taught it, maybe over tw almost 20 years ago, actually ended up finding a company that actually does this, okay? And, and it's one of the primary companies that makes this sort of calculates these in the cloud so that people can do it. Because it's a very time con computationally intensive um, experiment uh, processing to do. Um, so there, the video is there, and, and this is what's called 4D flow. So if you want to know more about that, you can look at 4D flow. Okay. Uh, one issue that we deal with is, remember, we're talking about phase. And so, uh, whoops. Uh, so with phase, remember, once the phase goes past, so if I have some phase, but once it goes past 180 degrees, I don't know whether the spin went this way or whether the spin went this way. Right, so there's this ambiguity about whether I had a positive flow or a negative flow. So that's something that we have to, technicians have to worry about. And here's an example of that. Here's a vessel where it looks like in this pulmonary artery, um, there's flow going in both directions, okay? And so the question with MR imaging or any medical imaging is you wanna know, is that actually biological or is that an artifact of my imaging? Right, because it could be, I mean, it could, there is weird flow that happens in people. And in this case, that would be like, oh my God, this, we need to do something, right? It turns out that this is just what's, this is a form of velocity aliasing, where basically the flow uh, had, the negative flow was sort of, had too large of a phase. And so it was going, appeared as if going in the opposite direction. So in this case, the, the, uh, the right decision is there's a the knob you can tweak on the scanner or parameter where you just make that maximum velocity higher saying, you know, 180 degrees of phase corresponds to certain velocity. If I just make that higher, then I can protect myself against this aliasing. And if you do that, it turns out this person is normal, that all the flow is going in the right direction. Okay. So there is, that's why radiologists have to have some understanding of physics because otherwise you might inter misinterpret uh, an image as a disease where actually it's just an artifact. Um, so that's that solution. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about is inflow effect, which is essentially as blood's flowing in and we apply RF pulses, it gets saturated. Remember, every time we apply RF pulse, we can think of sort of blood starting off back at zero and then recovering. Okay. So if you keep applying RF pulses, everything that doesn't move just keeps getting knocked back down. Okay. But everything that's flowing in is coming up with fresh magnetization. So it will tend to appear brighter. So flowing blood will tend to appear brighter. And this is what's known as the inflow effect. And this actually, in the early days of MR, this was considered an artifact. Like say, oh, this is not good. We, we want to get rid of this. But then someone said, well, actually, that's super useful because I can make images like this. Okay, This is what's called time of flight angiography, which is just based on this principle that if I just totally saturate, keep applying RF pulses here, it's gonna knock down the tissue that's static. So all the flowing spins will appear bright. Okay, so this now becomes a very standard part of MR exam. So anything, especially where there's some concern about the vasculature, they will typically have a time of flight angiography to see what your vessels look like. And so this is really um, a good example that happens a lot in MR where usually someone will notice something wrong with the image and say, oh my God, this is terrible, it's an artifact, right? And either someone will immediately or it might take 10 years for someone to say, well, actually that's really useful. Okay, and I can actually use this, All right? So um, keep in mind that uh, one person's artifact is another person's 
method, okay? And if you're the first person to figure out how to use that artifact, you could then patent it, you know, it becomes your method. And so just keep your eye out for that. Uh, whatever field of science you're in, oftentimes the best discoveries come when something isn't quite right, but you have to go, oh, actually that's pretty cool. Okay. okay, so I'm just gonna spend about five minutes summing up before we go into logistics. Um, one thing about an MR is it's, it's still a pretty expensive modality, right? And so as we're moving into the future, one thrust for MR especially uh, is how can you get MR to be lower cost? So both lowering the cost for developed countries, but also how do you get more MR into countries that are not as well developed, okay? Where there's not the infrastructure or, or the economics to support it. So it turns out that one area where you can really lower the cost is making the magnet cheaper. This tends to be the most expensive part for the magnet, okay? The next is the gradient coils and the gradient amp because these are very high powered amplifiers. So that's your biggest bang for the buck reducing magnet costs and also reducing the gradient stuff. Everything else is expensive, but much less. I mean, computers keep coming down in price, electronics and stuff is, you know, keeping coming down in price as well. And so because of that, you know, the number of units per, in this case, million inhabitants varies a lot from country to country. So here in Germany where uh, Siemens is, so there's gonna be a lot of MR systems here. You know, there's 34 per million. Even if you go to a place like Canada, it drops pretty fast to 10, right? And then in Ghana and India, even less, okay? So the manufacturers look at this and go, this is a huge opportunity, right? Okay. And then from a population health point of view, if you can bring more MRI in these areas, then hopefully if it's used correctly, you can sort of reduce healthcare or improve healthcare, okay? Reduce healthcare costs, improve the quality of healthcare. One thing is to use less helium. As we talked about in the first lecture on MRI, helium costs are going up, helium is a scarce quantity. So there is a push to go to lower helium magnets. Uh, this is one that Siemens just came out with is just 0.71 liters of liquid helium compared to like over a thousand uh, for typical magnet. And so this is their magneton Freemax and just showing that, um, you know, it's not, it's even, it has less helium um, and it is um, also easier to install. And so it's just less, less expensive um, to have. Uh, we mentioned this one, this is something out of Hyperfine, which is even a smaller magnet here. Um, and this just uses a, a sort of a, instead of using liquid helium, it's just sort of room temperature uh, uh, coils. And here they had to use a lot of deep learning because they're at a fairly low field strength, it's 0 0.064 Tesla. And so without deep learning, this is what they get. And then with a lot of deep learning, they can improve it somewhat. Now it's still not to the quality of um, conventional imaging. So for example, um, you know, this is the image you might get um, with your low cost. And this is the image you might get with conventional imaging. So when it were and how it could be used, it is still TBD. I mean, it's still sort of an experiment as to what the market is for this, but the idea is that there probably is some market for this, um, but the economics will have to be figured out. Um, Michael Crichton, some of you know, is the author of Jurassic Park and other sort of sci-fi novels. And so he even, um, you know, 25 years ago, he was saying, well, maybe we should just use, you know, the problem with, using uh, with MRIs, you need really big magnets, right? 1.5 Tesla is what he was saying. Uh, and he's saying, we don't need that. So as your magnetic field goes down, your magnetization goes down too. So you have less signal, but what if your detector was more sensitive, okay? And it turns out that there's something in physics called squids or superconducting quantum interference devices. So they're so sensitive, they can measure resonance just from the Earth's magnetic field. And so in fact, a group at Berkeley actually did this. So they actually built um, these very low field magnets, okay? Um, in, in fact, the polarization field is just from a little coil here, okay? These are the gradient fields out here. And then here is the squid conductor. Now, the problem with this is it's a cool idea, but this still has to be cooled, I think with liquid nitrogen or something. So it's still a little bit problematic. 
But proof of principle, they were able to, this is the, one of their first images. This is of this pepper, okay? Now this is 132 microtesla. Okay, so it's only, remember the Earth's field is about 50 microtesla. This is only about two and a half times Earth's magnetic field. Okay, and yet they're able to come up with this image here. Okay. Uh, and they even, uh, actually, I think I know this guy, but okay. Um, this is a, one of the folks at Berkeley. They actually even built a human uh, version of this and sort of could get sort of image of the human brain um, and maybe even sort of like the cerebral spinal fluid artifacts. Okay, so this is an MRI of the human brain at 130 microtesla. Okay, so it is possible. Is this useful clinically? No, I mean, this is still not great, but it is a proof of principle that, you know, maybe if the engineering is done correctly, um, this might be in a way to go about it. Um, but once again, one of the issues is you're using liquid nitrogen. Okay, um, so some other approaches that we talked about are one, we talked about the gradient coils being really uh, using a lot of power. And so this was a cute design where this is actually the magnet built up of sort of permanent magnets. And in this case, it's almost like CT to get the gradients in different directions, they just rotate the magnet around. Okay, so you could actually imagine if you're out in the wilderness and you had just a little bit of electricity, you could just have a hand crank and do this. And obviously this was done at MIT. So that's why they have to have the image with MIT in the name. And this was actually this person's PhD thesis. Um, and then this is a design where they said, well, let's, what do we make the magnet into a cap, right? And, and then here they actually have gradient coils that are using wires. Um, and they get some reasonably good looking images. Um, these are some phantoms. Um, and then this is the latest version where it's almost more like a conventional magnet where you actually have a permanent magnet creating coils and RF shield. And so um, they have to deal with the fact that these are not ideal fields. So if you look at um, the images, uh, they actually don't look so great if you just do an FFT, but then you apply some of the tricks we talked about and the images start looking a little better although the recon still obviously has a way to go. Okay. So there is work being done in this area. And so it's gonna be very interesting to see. So on the one hand, we talked about people are building bigger and bigger magnets for research. Um, deep learning is having a big impact on what you can do and that's allowing people to go to lower fields. And so I think it's gonna be very interesting um, over the next you know, 10 or 20 years to see how, how far that goes. Okay. I think the vision is that um, you know, certainly some people would like to see it such that, you know, you could have an MRI at your local Walmart or you know, CBS or something like that, okay? So uh, MRI is fairly young technology. It's only about 50 years old, okay? And so um, I think there's still, there's a lot been done, but there's still a lot to do. And so, um, you know, and a lot of the new innovations will come from, you know, graduate students and postdocs. Um, so, uh, I think anyone who's interested in the area, certainly there, there's still a lot of work to be done in MRI, uh, either using MRI in interesting ways or developing new MRI technologies. Um, so that's the last slide I have for the course material. So are there any questions before we sort of switch over into logistics? Okay, so let me just, just check my email really quickly. Okay, so let's talk about a few things. One is um, I will be posting um, uh, sort of a more deep, I'll be posting a, a schedule for the project two presentations um, and they'll have some guidelines for both the, the live and the recorded um, groups. Uh, it will be very similar to last time. Um, the live groups will do it here, um, but it'll still be over Zoom. So we could just sort of switch sharing of the screens and not have to worry about spending three minutes debugging the connection, okay? Uh, so just be prepared to present over Zoom if you're live. Um, and uh, if you're recorded, um, the main suggestion that we're gonna have is it does help. Uh, we're not gonna post these things, so don't worry about privacy, but it, it is, if you can record with Zoom and have your camera on and, and your name, so just, just help sort of, you know, us sort of, it's, it's more interactive for us, even though it's recorded, it, 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 it's actually easier for us to watch the videos. Uh, if we can actually see someone talking. 
Um, so the schedule will be posted. Basically, the live groups will go in order, like L01, L02, as last time. Um, uh, but be prepared to go either before or after in case there's a group that doesn't show up or something like that, okay, or a group that's running late. Okay, so are there any other general questions or comments about the project too? Yes. I will record it, but um, you know, we we just we were having a question about whether to post it on YouTube, and we're, we're probably not simply because, you know, then if people's faces are showing and they don't want to show, we're not gonna we're not gonna make it. But we can certainly put the recording on Canvas if if, if you wanted to see it or something like that. But uh, that's our plan right now is not to post it. Yeah, I mean, in person, it's the camera doesn't really have to be on because we we can see you here. Uh, it's just for the recorded ones as we're watching you know uh 12 different videos it just it helps us keep our attention better any other questions okay um so uh there is you know um i did as i mentioned um let me stop recording for this part